down northwest of Red Deer. No reports of damage. Within minutes, the wind picked up, the rain came down, the lightning over the city has been spectacular tonight. Right now it is 18 degrees in downtown Edmonton. The wind is southeast at 20, gusting up to 50 kilometers an hour. Humidity stands at 83%, pressure 29.77 inches or 100.8 kilopascal. And right now we're concerned with the people that are in immediate danger. And we have the area blocked off for now, moving as many spectators back as we can. We have found pockets of people that were trapped and uh, have res rescued them. They're out now, but we're right now, again, looking for people. That what about injuries? Involved. What about deaths? We're not sure. We know that there were uh, several people that were severely injured that have gone to hospital. We moved those people immediately. And uh, as I said, the minor injuries, most of those people were evacuated right away. There are many buildings here that are collapsed. Is there still possibility of, of people being in them? Oh, very much so. And uh, as a matter of fact, that's the, our major effort and concern right now is to find out if there are other people still trapped. What are you going to be doing all night long? I take it you're just going to have to go through each one of these buildings and try and move this steel, this concrete. Exactly. And uh, now that uh, we've moved the people that were severely injured, it's to get back in there and find out, then it could be a long, drawn-out process, but we are in the midst of organizing to uh, get those people out. Kelly McLugan, CBC News, Edmonton. Just a reminder, the police have closed 50th Street between Yellowhead and 137th Avenue. Travel along that route is strictly for emergency vehicles only. We are expecting more bad weather. The weather office says that we should expect another wave of tornadoes between 6 and 7 o'clock tonight. We'll keep you up to date. Woods recovery crews are on the scene. That area has been blocked off by police. Further south from here in Mill Woods, several people were injured. A tornado ripped through a condominium complex. Several fires were sparked by that. Gas is leaking. And we have no word yet, uh, confirmation on the extent of injuries or if anybody has been killed. The tornado moved on through this area, flattening buildings, ripping down cranes, crushing vehicles, and moved uh, on to the northeast at the Evergreen Mobile Home Park in far northeast Edmonton. At least 70 people have been injured. The tornado ripped through there, destroyed some 100 trailers. Police have blocked 50th Street coming north from there all the way down to 111th Avenue to have an emergency access route to bring people into the hospitals in the city. The Red Cross has set up an emergency shelter for tornado victims right across town. It appears the tornado began in the southeast corner of the city and worked its way through the green belt between Edmonton and Sherwood Park and then on to the north. We have no complete figures, of course, yet on the extent of damage, but it will be in the many, many millions. Many people have been killed. We do know of at least five or six deaths in separate areas of the city. One person called to say a body had been found near the sewer outlet at the James McDonald Bridge. Others have been located at 34th Street and 38th Avenue. And as you can see from the pictures here, people trapped inside this destruction will not have survived. This storm came on the heels of another storm that hit last night. There were no tornadoes to speak of last night, but there were high winds and heavy damage. That caused problems for this weekend's Heritage Festivals. Franco Catoni has that story. This is Franco Catoni. The cleanup was... I'm afraid that could be as bad, possibly, as the one that just went through the Edmonton area. It's in the Pinoka stretch from Pinoka to Lake Wobbam right now, and it's moving north-northeast at a very rapid rate. It's scheduled to arrive in the Edmonton area around 6.30, so less than an hour from now. Again, the weather office has issued a severe weather warning in that storm with the possibility of tornadoes, but they are not saying there will be tornadoes. The best advice is to keep your eye out for funnel clouds, and if you see them, uh, head down to your basement, if possible, or uh, open the windows in your apartment to let the air blow through as much as possible. Back to you, Doug. Thanks, Neil. Neil, we'll have, uh, have more on the weather in just a few minutes. We've been uh, covering the assignment desk all day today, and I guess this afternoon it started to get pretty insane. Uh, we've got crews all over. What, uh, what can you tell us about the latest situation? Well, we've, had, uh, we've got about four camera crews out right now. Uh, we've got them all across the city. Some of the real problem areas, you saw some earlier footage, that was near the Byers Transport Building. Apparently one person has been killed, at least one. The devastation there you saw earlier. There are several people injured, and it appears that several people have also been trapped in buildings. Uh, looks like that's what we've got right here. 
This storm actually hit about 3.30 in this area, completely leveled buildings. Uh, it's at the Byers building, apparently at 34th Street and near 76th Avenue. This is the area anyway. Two people were trapped in the rubble here. One was critically injured, and apparently one person has been confirmed dead from the Byers building. We have no names and we have no other information there. But it appears that the biggest problem so far is out of the Evergreen Trailer Park at 167th Avenue and 10th Street. At least 70 people have been injured there. The tornado ripped through about 100 trailer homes. Most of them are flipped over. Most of them are totally destroyed. The city has set up an emergency access route at 50th Street from 111th Avenue northbound. People are being asked to stay away from that area altogether, please. The injured are being transported to hospitals across the city. Crews are still going through the rubble out there looking for more survivors. Some of these people don't even know their homes have been destroyed. They're still coming back from work. The Red Cross has set up an emergency shelter for the victims, apparently. That's located at 99th Avenue on 106th Street. And several hotels have apparently offered to put up their services. The Renfrew Inn on White Avenue has asked uh, survivors, uh, anyone who has no home, to call them, and they will try to put people up. A number of uh, residents have just been calling in offering to put up some of the survivors as well. There is an emergency office being set up at uh, City Hall right now. Officials are all there trying to sort out uh, what's going on, trying to get a plan in the works. We'll have more information from City Hall as the evening progresses. A CNR building at 23rd Street and 85th Avenue, it was heavily damaged and uh, most of the buildings were torn right, right down. We don't have a death toll right now, but they are also on the scene at a train disaster. We have a crew there and we will have footage back from that. That train disaster was reported at 61st Avenue and 30th Street. Police say at least three people may be dead. An ammonia tanker car is derailed and a dangerous goods cruise. Uh, they're all out at the scene. Every single crew available is there. Every ambulance in the city and the outlying areas has been called into service. In Mill Woods, uh, we also have video coming from Mill Woods. Several people have been injured after the tornado ripped through that area, sparking several fires. Gas is apparently leaking. We've got, in fact, all across the city, there have been reports of buildings completely flattened and uh, people injured, fires everywhere. Every single crew, emergency crew available, is out on the scene right now. Well, the, the pictures speak for themselves, and it's a shocking situation. I, I've uh, seen pictures like this in some of the southern states where the uh, tornadoes move up Tornado Alley, but this is unusual to find something this far north. Uh, any indication from you've been talking to the police and the fire and the rescue people of, of the extent of the city that's damaged? Is it mostly in the east or exactly It looks where? like it's mostly, uh, it started in one section of the city. It started on the south side and it started to move southeast and it just went right through and uh, seemed to go along a, a path to the northeast section of the city. And uh, there are, we have had reports from liter literally everywhere from uh, damage and injuries and uh, Bodies reported. I took several calls as well. It seemed most of the damage uh, centered on the eastern half of Mill Woods, and then it seemed to move up between Sherwood Park and Edmonton for the most part, clipped the uh, eastern section of the city, and then up through, as we saw, to the Evergreen Mobile Home Park in the far northeast. That's right. We actually had calls from people that could see the tornado as it was coming. In fact, I think the first call that came in were saying that the tornado had touched down in Leduc and there was heavy damage. That's the first call that we had, the first sign of trouble, and from there we got a call from a Sherwood Park resident that said, it's right in front of me and as we were speaking the phone lines went dead and it seemed to travel right on from there. It's bad enough that we're having this disaster but the communication is almost impossible. The phones go dead every five minutes. You can't move in traffic because the traffic lights are all out so it's a difficult situation. Thank you for your help and I'm sure we'll have more throughout the night, uh, other pictures on the de devastation and we'll have more ITV News, sports and more on the weather in just a moment. But we will have the complete story for you on the tornado at 6 o'clock. Again, shelter information, the numbers on your screen. The city, here's Neil Fitzpatrick to bring us up to date. Well, Doug, a quick warning now that there is still a severe weather watch, but the weather office says there are no tornadoes in the radar at this point. It's right near the International Airport right now. It should hit Edmonton in about half an hour or so. But I repeat, there are no tornadoes in the weather office's radar scan right now, so we can hope for the best. Still, though, a major storm on its way. We did just get a call from someone in Devon who said there's a big storm. They said there was a tornado just uh, in front of them, and they were going to the basement, slammed the phone down. But uh, again, that could just be heavy rain, heavy wind. But nevertheless, there is serious weather on its way. Exactly. Uh, uh, and we have, uh, we have some more pictures, we understand, uh, coming in right now from this storm. And let's have a look at those. Uh, give you an idea of the devastation. You've already seen pictures uh, near the Byers area. 
Here we go right now. This looks like some home video that was shot earlier. We had uh, several people offering us home video there in the background. You can see the tornado touching down. This looks like this was in the Mill Woods area. Doug, I was just up on the roof of ITV, and I can see the storm clouds forming off to the, uh, the southwest of Edmonton. They're moving very quickly. Within five minutes, it com had completely changed shape. Um, but again, uh, we can only hope for the best and hope that there are no, to no tornadoes in this next system coming through. Well, this is obviously uh, the tornado moving in from the south, heading uh, through the city. And as we said earlier, there was heavy damage in Mill Woods. Here it comes now, and you can see the, the rain hitting and the, the wind swirling in the background. Uh, we've had several offers of people who have shot this on their home video to, to lend it to us. We're not sure of the gentleman's name or the person's name who shot this video, but we will uh, get his name and we'll have it for you on our 10 o'clock program and we have more information and have this all assembled. Uh, you saw on the screen earlier a couple of uh, numbers uh, for emergency situations. If you're in a situation where you've lost your house or you're uh, flooded out or the roof is blown off your house or whatever the disaster happens to be, there's a City of Edmonton number. There you see it on your screen, 428-5736. And the Red Cross has also set up an emergency shelter and you can contact them at 423-2680. And we'll continue to provide updates on the situation in Edmonton and area as the evening progresses. Uh, Neil Fitzpatrick will have more on the weather in just a moment, but now Let's just take a moment out and we'll move over to sports. Okay. On the south side of the city, and that area has been declared a disaster area by county officials. Edmonton emergency staff say at least 150 people have been injured. The first wave of tornadoes entered the city along the south edge. Kelly McLugan reports on the damage in that area. The storm hit Edmonton just after 3 o'clock this afternoon. Within minutes, the reports are pouring in. Tornadoes. The first touches down in Mill Woods on Edmonton's south side. It stretches for blocks, sweeping northward along 50th Street. The tornado touches down again, flattening an industrial park. Well, we saw the tornado coming in from the south. Saw the power line shaking. We were watching from the shop and uh, from the doors of the shop. We heard a sound, it was just like a freight train. And uh, I had everybody move right to the center of the building. There's a concrete block portion in the center of it, and, uh, and we moved everybody into that area and into the center portion of the office and went right through, and I was sitting there, and then all of a sudden I could see daylight. And the whole roof, just everything disappeared. Next, the tornado hit the Sherwood Park Freeway, where rush hour had come early, thanks to the upcoming long weekend. Well, I just went through it. I went, just went, I drove through the tornado, that's all, and it didn't flip my car. It just, I made it through, and then I seen people all over the place dead, and bodies, and houses torn, and this. And right now, we're concerned with the people that are in immediate danger, and we have the area blocked off for now moving as many spectators back as we can. We have found pockets of people that were trapped and uh, have res rescued them. They're out now, but we're right now, again, looking for people. That what about involved. injuries? What about deaths? We're not sure. We know that there were uh, several people that were severely injured that have gone to hospital. We moved those people immediately. And uh, as I said, the minor injuries, most of those people were evacuated right away. There are many buildings here that are collapsed. Is there still possibility of, of people being in them? Oh, very much so. And uh, as a matter of fact, that's the, our major effort and concern right now is to find out if there are other people still trapped. What are you going to be doing all night long? I take it you're just going to have to go through each one of these buildings and try and move this steel, this concrete. Exactly. And uh, now that uh, we've moved the people that were severely injured, it's to get back in there and find out, and it could be a long, drawn-out process, but we are in the midst of organizing to uh, get those people out. And the rescue officials aren't alone. On the southeast edge of the city, where the tornado first hit, residents stand surrounded by devastation. One of those is Dale Campbell, who was on his way home from work. So I'm coming home to go home here in Mill Woods, and I got caught right in the tornado. Um, there was houses flying across 23rd Avenue, trucks flying across. Um, I got out of my truck to help people and got thrown 30 feet across into a field. 
and when I got up, um, there were people laying all over the place, so we'd picked up a couple of, of bodies, injured people with food hardly any faces left and put them in the back of my truck and, and took them out to the ambulances on, on the Shore Park Freeway. And all over the southeast end of town, the story was the same. All we saw is the big, the wind touched down and I rounded my family up and took them down the basement. Did you hear anything down in the basement? Oh, Christ, I heard everything down, we were scared silly. I mean, everything was coming off the house, and then we heard a big bang coming off this next door, I guess, when the roof came off. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what we're going to do. Where'd you go? Down in the basement where cement was, underneath the stairs. Did you hear anything? Yeah. What'd it sound like? <laughs> Is this your place? Thought it was. <laughs> what, uh, <laughs> what happened? Well, uh... It was just a tornado, I guess, but the funnel came dead square right on the roof of the house, dropped right down on top, and lifted the whole roof right off, and then dropped down on the fence behind, and you can see the fence is all gone, and then it just headed straight towards that farmer's house and all those trees, and all we saw was the trees being all uprooted, and his house just disappeared. Six miles south in Beaumont, barns were blown off their foundations, their occupants scattered throughout the fields. Ever seen anything like this in your life? No, I've never seen a truster before. I tell you, it's one hairy experience to have to look at the sucker. Those not caught in the path of the tornado captured it on film. These pictures were taken by amateur photographers, and these taken by a government employee out of a window of Edmonton's weather office. At least 100 people have been taken to hospital, but it's too early yet for accurate estimates of the dead and the injured. Kelly McLugan, CBC News, Edmonton. We have just received reports of two more storm systems moving our way. One is coming in from the Beaumont area once again. And in the West End, latest reports are that the storm is now there. Trees are apparently snapping like twigs. There's hail and extremely violent winds. So two more storm systems moving our way in the area even as we speak. We also have an urgent message for all University of Alberta nurses this evening. You are needed for duty. You've been asked to phone the hospital immediately. That is all university. University of Alberta nurses. And the Red Cross has information for you about homes or hotels for people whose residences have suffered heavy damage. You can see the number on your screen. This is the number you call tonight, 423-2680, for people whose residences have suffered heavy damage. And right now we are going to go over to Lee McKenzie because, Lee, you were at the weather office this afternoon when that storm was moving in. That's right. You know those pictures that you were seeing before? Mm -hmm. Well, I was standing at the window watching that. When it first came in, I was up on the roof with the people at the Weather Center. You could see it over Mill Woods, and it was a very loose-looking cloud. It didn't have that, that specific shape to it. But as it came closer, it became that black cloud that you've seen in the pictures. You could see the debris flying around. It was a very frightening experience. Now, what happened inside the building? Well, as it came closer, we thought it was going to pass to the east of us, you see. And we kept watching. It was coming right for the weather center. The lights went out in the building. The call went out for everyone to get into the stairwells. And once the storm had passed us, because, uh, of course, we didn't actually see it go by because we were down in the stairwells, when I came back up, glass was breaking in the skylight in the center of the building. Someone had been cut by glass and was bleeding. And uh, things were fairly calm. But although I know people have been in much more disastrous mm -hmm. situations, that was very, very frightening. It must have been. You have some information about how all of this started. Perhaps you could just explain it for us. Right. In the midst of all this, I did manage to sit someone down at the weather office who could explain to me how a tornado works. And that's what I'm going to tell you about now. Now, you need two major ingredients for a tornado to be created. Severe thunderstorms and a cold, active jet stream. Let's start with the thunderstorms and take it from there. This is Alberta, and our situation today looked like this. This was a cold front coming through the province. Now, you know that I've been telling you about this cold front coming through for the last couple of days. Well, as it came through today, this is what it happened. We all know about the hot and humid air that's been sitting in our province for the last few days. The air on this side of the front is cooler and drier. Now, We'll go down to this, this part of the map because I want to tell you what happens when that happens. Here's the Rocky Mountains, and here's our plains. We've got our hot and humid air sitting here. When the cold air comes in, it comes in like a wedge because it's heavier than the hot air. So it looks something like this. This is our cooler, drier air coming in in this direction. It's lifting this hot air as it comes through. 
But the hot air can't escape because now we're going to start talking about the jet stream. The jet stream is a very high layer of air. This is it up here, if I could spell it properly, jet stream, and it is also cold. So you end up with like a hot, humid air sandwich. You've got the cold air down here, because this has been moving in, the cold air up here, and hot, humid air jammed in between, and that air gets very turbulent and ferocious. You start to get those terrific thunderstorms right where all this is happening. And that's what happens on the front. Now, come back to the jet stream in a moment. You know when you're riding in a car, and you go around a corner like this quite quickly, you feel thrown in this direction. You, you sort of si sidle over to the car like this. Well, if the jet stream is going in an arc and is going quickly enough, it has a spin-off effect, and it spins the air off like that. Now, you already know what that looks like. If that happens, it spins it like a top, like a child's top with a string on it. You give it a good yard, the top spins, and the string has been pulled away and that's what's forced the top to spin around. Well, think of that jet stream action and this little swirl in exactly the same way, except the jet stream doesn't quit. The jet stream is like a string that just keeps on going and keeps on spinning this. Okay, now take your jet stream and put that action over this same front that we talked about here and the severe thunderstorms. And when that little swirl happens, it's intensified. Twenty-seven hours since killer tornadoes touched down in our city. Tonight we mourn the deaths of 25 people, possibly more to come. The medical examiner's office has identified most of the victims. First, those killed in the Evergreen Trailer Park. Five have been named. 15-year-old Sharon Andrichow, 50-year-old Merle Bain, Marie Barker, also 50 years of age, 55-year-old Lloyd Fankenel, 73-year-old Edna Nolan. From the devastation in southeast Edmonton's industrial area, 19-year-old George Dimitrios, 30-year-old Ajmer Daliwal, 29-year-old Richard Gillespie, 18-year-old Daniel Lewis, 40-year-old Adito Mendoza, 54-year-old Clement Nault, 43-year-old Graham Palmer, and 41-year-old Gregory Trebinic. The cause of death in all cases is listed as multiple blunt injuries. Eleven people remain to be identified. The Red Cross is compiling lists of victims and survivors. It is crucial that if you are one of the people displaced by the storm or if a member of your family is still missing, that you call the Red Cross at 423-2680. There will no doubt be many memorial services in the days to come. The first we've heard about will be an ecumenical service Monday at 10 in the morning at St. John Bosco's Roman Catholic Church. Well, city officials are working through the weekend to try and assess the total damage and return essential services back to normal. Earl Morgan and photographer Rick Bremness flew over the tornado's path today to retrace its wide swath of destruction. It was mid-afternoon when reports began filtering in. Tornadoes were hitting down in Edmonton. It cut a wide path along the eastern outskirts of the city from the south to the north. After first touching down in Beaumont, the twisters moved toward the city. Farmland on the outskirts were the first to feel its effects. The outer edge of Mill Woods was next. Here we see the just over two dozen houses that were either completely or partially destroyed. Tornadoes then moved along the path of power lines into the county of Strathcona, hitting an industrial park where it claimed its first victims. If the route had been uh, a mile or two further into the city, the destruction uh, and this could have been uh, a major catastrophe and I, I think relatively speaking uh, God was on our side in that respect but it doesn't min minimize uh, the tremendous tragedy that, that did occur. The storm then turned back toward the city hitting the outskirts of the That's northeast free. neighborhood of Clairview. Mayor DeCorey is disappointed that Environment Canada could not give more advance warning about the severity of the storm and wants a review of the procedures. I'm told that the environment meteorologists uh, cannot give notice of a tornado until they actually make the visual sighting of a tornado. Uh, I'd like that reviewed. I'm not casting any fingers or, or aspersions or making it sound like it could have been better because I'm not sure. But 
perhaps if we had had better warning, uh, maybe something different could have been done. Maybe more time could have been given to some people. The tornado then began moving away from the city, leaving one final fatal blow before leaving at the Evergreen Trailer Court. Of the 20 that died in Edmonton, 13 deaths occurred here. Private security personnel were hired to protect the damaged property and personal belongings during the night. One of the uppermost things in our minds that we had to really look after security. It's tragedy enough to lose your property, and it's even worse when somebody goes in and steals it from a, from a site like that. So security was a very key thing in both areas, particularly the one in, uh, in the Evergreen Trailer Park. And we had good security on there uh, right from the beginning. Uh, we had one incident throughout the night where uh, a vehicle was observed traveling towards the area and into the area, and we suspected it may be there for a purpose of looting, but uh, it found, it, we, we found it was unfounded. So we've really had no incidents that we know of yet of, of people stealing from the, from the strike sites. The city responded to the disaster in a way never seen before. This is the miracle on 119th Street. Hundreds of cars began arriving late last night with food, clothing, and money for the victims. Others have stayed to give a helping hand. I really think we're going to have to find a new word and put it in the dictionary to describe it. We've been going nonstop for 24 hours. Um, we have got probably about 15,000 square feet of warehouse space now, and it's full. We've got a secondary warehouse that we arranged with the mayor when he was here uh, at the Old Western GMC uh, warehouse on Kingsway. We've got over 100 volunteers working here. There is no way that we can keep up with the supply. People are bringing things in faster than we can even begin to sort them. The final word of the center is that for now they are asking people to stop dropping off items to give them at least a couple of days to sort through everything. That will allow them time to get out as fast as possible the supplies needed to the storm victims. Earl Morgan, 23TV Eyewitness News. And it seems as always when tragedy does strike, that's when the community binds even closer together. Earl Morgan is in the studio live with us right now. Earl, first question, how far are we before getting essential services back in, back in place again? Well, Darrell, we're probably at least uh, another day or two because there's, there's at least 2,000 homes that uh, are without gas still in various parts of the city, mostly in the, in the Mill Woods area. Uh, they have to put in a complete new phone exchange, of course, in the Evergreen Trader Court, and they're trying to install emergency phone lines now. And as well, um, they, they, they have a few spotted areas in the city where they still have to get at with, with other services. What about possible dangers with, when you're talking of gas, uh, you know, no gas left for some houses and some electricity out, has there been and is there still any danger to anyone from gas leaks, electrical lines that may still be live? Uh, most of the gas has been shut off. In fact, all the gas has been shut off in the, in the affected areas. But as you saw in the aerial footers, there's still several down power lines, and you're being asked if you come across any power lines, even in the city or outside, not to go near them, but report them. They may or may not have been reported yet. Good advice. Something the mayor brought up was that he was hoping or wishing or yearning that there could have been just a little bit more time to give, especially the residents in Evergreen, a little more time to uh, hide, to get to some shelter. Is there any chance of getting more warning when you're talking about tornadoes? Well, what he was talking about is, is he was saying that uh, it, would, it would be better to err on the side of caution because he mentioned that uh, the weather office cannot say we have tornado until they see it. And he's saying if you're getting reports of them, then maybe you should say there are reported sightings of tornadoes unofficial. That way people could, could probably get to get to the basements of the areas that are going to be hit, if you can tell where it's going to go. Uh, Evergreen was, was something that, uh, that would have been tough because there's no basements and trailers, but still there may have been something that they could do to, to take evasive action. He's not critical of Environment Canada, he's just saying maybe they should be able to change their policy to be a bit more uh, open-ended on that. And the bottom line is if you're wrong, a little bit of a red face is a lot better than what we saw in the Evergreen Court. Exactly. The other thing that we've been seeing today is an incredible reaction from Edmontonians to try and help out. Volunteer services, food, clothing. Uh, you saw Heather Ayres in the report from Earl. How is everything going as far as relief services are concerned? Absolutely phenomenal. Last night there was a thousand city emergency personnel called into service. Now that's uh, the fire department, the police department, 
uh, and ambulance, all were up to full staff. They called in people off shift that were on holidays, anybody they could get hold of, and virtually everybody they contacted came in. The only ones they didn't call were people who were supposed to come in early today because they knew they needed some fresh personnel at some point in the game. Um, as far as at the emergency relief center, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. You go down there and it's, it's like uh, a, a beehive of activity. It's mm. like an anthill. There's just people, nobody's telling anybody what to do. It's just all getting done and people are dropping in with uh, $2,000 donations and $500 donations and whatever is needed in the way of cash because you still have to buy gas and things to get all these supplies out and clothes and food it's it's absolutely phenomenal i couldn't believe it but what you know i should mention again that what what heather is asking is that people at least try and slow down in that area for at least just a couple of days because they do have they have no time to sort it it's yeah. just coming in mm -hmm. and in the next couple of days people are going to start coming in that were struck by the tornado that are victims that are looking for some kind of relief now and if they, they can't hand it out if they don't know what they've got so they're saying please just hold it for a couple of days as a reporter who has been in Edmonton for many years, is there anything more anyone else could have done to uh, help relieve the disaster? I don't think there's anybody who's going to be too critical of, of uh, emergency services. I mean, all units were booked to capacity last night. Every unit in the city was out. Um, so I, I don't think anybody that was seriously hurt was, was missed intentionally anyway. Um, I'm sure there's people that may still be missing or, mm -hmm. or may have been injured, but not because uh, the city didn't know they were there. Thank Earl Morgan, thank you very much, and we'll be back after this break. We continue now with the coverage of those devastating tornadoes from yesterday. The devastation continued into southeast Edmonton's industrial area. Twisted steel and piles of rubble are everywhere, and it is through that destruction that searchers are looking. This report is from Bill Marks. A scene of total devastation. As dawn broke over southeast Edmonton's industrial area, rescue crews who had worked through the night carefully sifted through the rubble, searching for bodies believed to be buried beneath the demolished buildings, the steady drizzle of rain hampering their efforts. Officials say the chances of finding survivors is slim. Uh, there were victims found in, the mar in among the rubble here. What are the chances of finding any survivors after the rain all night and the uh, lengthy wait it's been? I would say very unlikely indeed, to be absolutely honest, but of course there's always that hope that there is someone out there that we can rescue, but I think if anyone is under there now, then they're, they're not likely to be alive. The twister cut a 10 square block path of destruction, which killed at least seven people here, injuring more than 150. I got here about two minutes before it hit, and uh, that might just park my car and I went to the back of the shop and walked in and uh, I just heard it coming and I don't know what it was I just figured the best thing would to do was stand in the door frame and I went back over and I looked where I was standing before and uh, I think that's the only thing the steel door frame the door was over me is the only thing that saved my life you banged up pretty bad uh, yeah I went to the doctor last night and uh, he wants to see me again today but it should be alright more than 150 firemen and police officers, assisted by about 100 volunteers, are at the disaster scene, believing more victims will be found beneath the piles of brick, wood, and shredded metal. Other rescue crews combed the surrounding fields, searching for bodies that could have been carried by the winds which exceeded 120 kilometers an hour. The twisters hit with such force that cars were thrown across roads like play toys. Telephone poles snapped like toothpicks, bark was stripped from broken trees, and metal electrical towers reduced to twisted, contorted skeletons strewn on the ground. With bangs, and cuts and scrapes, that's all. Just about sucked them out the door. Some of the lucky survivors returned to the disaster scene to survey the carnage caused by the tornadoes. I'm just coming back to see what I can salvage. Uh, the, some tools want not, and I was looking for my ID. <laughs> what are your plans now? I don't know. Uh, get through this. Uh, I lost my, my vehicle and whatnot, so go look for another job, I guess. In the rural community of Beaumont, 10 kilometers Sorry, south, here, more destruction control. and broken dreams. 73-year-old Jerry Henschel watched the tornado tear his barn from the foundation, sucking it across his lawn, where it slammed into a power pole. His garage and two cars also destroyed. And at this dairy farm, lost cattle. The high winds throwing this animal 50 meters to its death. 
back in the hard-hit industrial area, damage is estimated to be in the millions. Officials with disaster services and the Edmonton Police Department say search crews will continue sifting through this rubble until they're sure that no bodies remain buried, and that job could take at least a week. In the meantime, all the lucky survivors who lived through this carnage can do is thank God they're alive and try to get on with the rest of their lives. Queen Elizabeth sent a telegram to Lieutenant Governor Helen Hunley today expressing shock in hearing about the devastating tragedy in our city. The telegram reads, quote, I was deeply shocked to hear the dreadful tornado which caused such widespread havoc in Edmonton. Please pass my deepest sympathy to those that have been so tragically bereaved and all the others that have suffered. It is signed, Elizabeth R. Well, we can tell you about the victims, tell you about the destruction, but it is only when you see what happened that one realizes how devastating the twisters were. We have this report from Bob Chelmick. They searched through the night, soldiers, firemen, volunteers, looking for survivors, and more often they found victims. For hours they dug through this one pile of rubble, a home looking for an elderly woman. She had not found the safety of a nearby basement. That's the grandmother, right? That's what they said, yeah. Yeah, that's what they said, the older woman, yeah. So, if that's the case... Well, well we haven't been through this. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go right this. through this, because there's a bunch of bedding and stuff in here, too. Yeah. yeah. So we'll go through this whole thing right well, here. Well, this is supposed to be an older lady, yeah? Yeah, yeah. and uh, they, a heavy set lady? Yeah. yeah, yeah. At 2 o'clock this morning, they found what they were looking for, but the woman was dead. Her body taken from the wreckage of her home to a temporary morgue set up in a nearby restaurant. But miraculously, in all this, there was life. A newborn baby pulled from the wreckage, frightened but alive. A 13-year-old girl found huddled in a washroom, the only room not destroyed in her family's home. Her parents had disappeared. A family pet in shock, cowering in the back seat of a car. As the morning dawned in gloomy overcast and drizzle, teams of emergency workers and volunteers were still feverishly sifting through the rubble looking for the dead and the injured. Many could only stand and wonder at nature's enormous power. They could only weep and look for strength within and with others. Speaking of what had happened was sometimes very hard. How do you feel now? I'm very, very upset because I know a lot of my neighbors are gone. I know they are. <laughs> People didn't know where their children were, where their husbands, their wives. People were running in from the highway, leaving their cars a mile away and running in, trying to find anyone they knew to find out news, eh? Did you find any people? I dug until just about 12 o'clock last night, and all we found was a, a dog and a cat. And we were looking through three trailers that were piled on top of each other. Just about a quarter of the park has been wiped out. Did you lose any friends? Yes, I did. Were they neighbors? Their prince. And it was like a freight train coming closer and closer and louder and louder until you couldn't hear anything anymore. It was just screaming. The first kid that came in was screaming, my auntie is dead, my auntie is dead. And I, your first reaction is that, well, kids panic fairly easily and, and you know, it's just um, maybe they were knocked out or something. But then other people were coming in afterwards saying that there were whole families lying dead on lawns. and. It's just, it was so hard just to take it all in. You know, it's a mobile home park. It's, it's, it's not, you know, a lot of people are going to say, I'll never live in a mobile. Well, that's wrong because there's houses. It didn't matter what it was. There's Kenworths that are just tied in knots. There's a uh, service station, brick. It's gone. It wouldn't have mattered what it was. If it walked through a residential in the city, it would have been the same thing. It was much the same in the Clareview residential neighborhood, several miles away from the Evergreen Mobile Home Park. The damage ranged here from missing roof shingles to missing houses, but miraculously, no one here was killed. This man has learned the meaning of miracles. His wife, a friend, and his tiny son were at home as the twister tore apart their $120,000 two-story house. All were injured, but all will survive. He was in his crib, and when she found him, there's no crib, and we still can't find a crib anywhere, and he was laying on the floor, on the rug in the house, underneath some debris. In that rubble? Yeah. yeah. What are your feelings? I have no feelings. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do next. It's just... All my friends are helping me out, and that's all I can go by. You haven't lost anybody, though. I guess no, you must feel all, very lucky. I just can't imagine it. I, they're, they're just so lucky somebody was looking out for them. The horror of this storm was tempered by some signs of good fortune. As luck would have it, the Evergreen Trailer Park was not nearly as crowded as it would have been an hour later. 
it could have taken hundreds of lives. The twister also missed the most populated areas of the city. If it had been a few miles to the north and west, thousands may have perished. The path through the industrial area just missed tearing apart the plants where dangerous chemicals are produced. But in the industrial northeast, other enterprises were not so lucky. This used to be the Sherwood Industrial Park, Strathcona County, just outside of Edmonton. Five people died here. One is still in critical condition. This is described today as still a very dangerous area. Stores of flammable and possibly deadly chemicals still pose a real hazard. The emergency response team says it may be a long time before the Sherwood Industrial Park is safe. But the buildings and the machines are one thing. The millions of dollars in property damage is minor compared to the real human tragedy. In some parts of the trailer park, total devastation. Splintered glass, shattered lumber, broken furniture, and broken dreams. Memories of happiness gone by. Many people died in this trailer court. Many more were injured. And from now on, for the next couple of weeks, hundreds will be looking for help from the Alberta government. What I've tried to tell the people I've met is that you will not be asked as individuals to take care of this. Uh, you couldn't ask individuals to protect themselves against this or to rebuild from it. The province and uh, all of the community pulling together are going to do it. We're going to rebuild for them. Would you say something to those people who have lost loved ones? Well, I've met some and I can only say that uh, my wife and I express on behalf of all Albertans and I guess Canadians uh, our tremendous uh, sense of sharing their grief and sympathy and for for them those who survive that we will help them in every way possible uh, we're going to do that uh, at every stage of this rebuilding and uh, they can count on the support of the province is there anything we can learn from this so it's so difficult Bob because nature uh, humbles you and leaves you so helpless uh, you uh, to prepare for this kind of a move by nature is almost impossible and i guess the only thing is to know that our our various uh, organizations have responded so superbly some people i've talked to have have lost everything their days they don't know where to turn what do they do next that they aren't alone that the uh, community uh, the province, the, the country, uh, are all with them. And that if they'll just uh, get to uh, some shelter organization or one of the assistance uh, areas, we'll help them. Uh, we know that there is a second wave going to hit of emotional impact. This is physical so much now. And it, rather than waiting for those people to come for us, we're developing right now outreach programs where we're going to be going throughout these communities to reach them, not have them try to find us. Many of these are low-income people living in mobile homes. Yes. Insurance is not going to cover much of it. And they aren't going to be asked to, uh, uh, to rely on insurance if, if it isn't covered. I've already told many of them. We don't expect individuals to protect themselves from this kind of devastation by nature. Nature, The province is going to step in and help them. We aren't going to do it on a legalistic basis. We're going to do it based on compassion and generosity of the whole community behind them. Just what did the Prime Minister offer? He offered any of the resources of the country, whether there was helicopters, uh, military. As a matter of fact, I've discussed today with the RCMP and they may well uh, get military help because there's now a problem with still searching for bodies and protecting from looting and it may well stretch them too thin. Uh, and so I think they will be calling in military assistance. Thank you, Mr. Premier. You're welcome. We've been hearing over the last day about how much damage these tornadoes have done. Into the hundreds of millions are some of the estimates, but it is the human tragedy which is hitting home to most of us. It, the destructive power is, is almost incredible of a tornado. Bob Chelmick is in our studio live with us today. Bob, how can you describe just what that tornado was able to do? I think, Daryl, it's, it's impossible to describe the force. It's, it's impossible to believe the force when you're actually at the site looking at uh, the destruction 
that it caused. Perhaps one story besides those, uh, those pictures of uh, the multi-ton vehicles turned over, not to mention the homes that were torn apart. Perhaps one story sums up some aspect of the power of that tornado. A policeman uh, at the Evergreen Trailer Court told me the story. There was a washing machine that was found near Bonacourt, and inside the washing machine there was a sales slip, and it indicated that the purchase had been made by someone who lived in the Evergreen Court. That's about 30 kilometers away. The wind picked up a washing machine, which I couldn't pick up, and took it 30 kilometers before setting it down somewhere else. It's, it's just mind-boggling. And I think right now, I think the phase we're in is amazement. There are lots of people going through grief, but I think the real grief, as uh, Premier Getty suggested, is yet to come. I think it's going to sink in in the next few days, and that's when we'll really feel uh, the heart pinch. It's a matter of everybody has a job to do. We have to try and get the people who are victims of this clothed and sheltered, but then it will be a, a week later. I'm sure. And you know, Edmonton hasn't ever experienced such a force of nature, has never experienced a tornado. This is the worst, of course, in, in Canadian history. I think perhaps we are totally unable to deal with it emotionally because it is such a freak experience. Uh, I'm not saying that the people of Texas or Kansas are able to deal with it much better, but at least they have sort of, sort of a fatalistic attitude because it happens every year. But here, a totally freak new experience that we're all going to have to get to deal with inside over time. Well, whenever we hear of disasters of this magnitude, and indeed this was a, a huge disaster on any world scale, we also hear of stories of people being able to pull together to be able to deal with, with what has happened. You spoke to a lot of people out on the streets of Edmonton who were involved in that, who were victims of the tornado. Did, were you able to feel any of that strength from them? I did. I did get a real sense that uh, there is a, a helping hand being uh, outstretched to these people from total strangers, certainly from their friends. Uh, there's still a great deal of concern about people not being able to get in touch with those that they think may have been there at the time or in that industrial park. There's that sense too, so there's real fear. But I think what we're seeing now is a real sense of community uh, building and uh, focused around places like the Emergency Relief Center and uh, Disaster Services. And uh, that, uh, of course, uh, takes a tragedy sometimes to bring it forth. But that is in itself heartwarming. It's when a disaster such as this strikes that a city with a metro population of some 800,000 definitely pulls together. Thank you for joining us, Bob. We'll be back after this break. Well, after yesterday's weather abomination, we are pleased to be able to relate somewhat better weather news for you tonight. It will be overcast this evening with some rain and a low near 10 degrees, and more of the same is forecast for most of tomorrow. But by the evening, the sky should clear off, and the high temperature is to reach 16 degrees. Monday's outlook is for a mainly sunny sky. And one further note, despite the tragedy and the damage that the tornadoes cost, the annual Heritage Festival is going to continue as planned. Organizers have been repairing tents all day, and they will stick to the schedule as best they can. Now, we realize there is a lot of information to try and assimilate. Michelle Jones has this wrap-up of some of the more important details. The official death toll in the wake of the devastating storm is 25. The medical examiner's office has yet to identify 11 bodies, and scores of people are still missing. 14 of the dead have been positively identified. The Red Cross is coordinating the effort to match names with inquiries. People are asked to call the Red Cross at 423-2680 if they have reported someone missing and have indeed found them. The Emergency Relief Center desperately needs volunteers, cash donations, and cardboard boxes. The center is located at 10820 119th Street. The call for food and clothing has been adequately met at this time. Many insurance companies have opened their doors over this long holiday weekend. Claimants are asked to call their individual company to check to see if the business is open. So far, we've been notified of one memorial service. St. John Bosco Roman Catholic Church in North Edmonton will hold an ecumenical memorial mass on Monday at 10 a.m. Michelle Jones, 23 TV, Eyewitness News. Today, there is more trouble in the Middle East. It began with clash tornado story as the cleanup continues and the victims try to come to grips with the disaster. And churches throughout the Edmonton area will be holding special services to commemorate the loss of the many victims in yesterday's tornado. 
Right now, though, stay tuned for City Beat. We will join that program in progress, an interview with new Police Chief Leroy Chawley. For now, from all of us here at ITV, thank you for joining us. We'll be on again tomorrow with updates and the news at 6 o'clock. Thank you. Good night. 27 people in Canada. NATO at Edmonton, Alberta is being called the deadliest to hit Canada in 75 years. It swept down on that prairie city of 650,000 during a storm of heavy rain, hail and high winds. It killed at least 27 people and injured 200. NBC's James Mokawa describes what happened. The search for survivors of yesterday's tornado is over. Officials believe all the missing have been accounted for. Some residents returned to what was left of their homes to salvage what they could. The homeless were given shelter and food. In this trailer park, one of the hardest hit communities, residents were stunned. I lost my son seven months ago today. And now I gotta find my other one. I can't talk, I can't talk. The tornado struck without warning. As it ripped through some sections of Edmonton, cars were lifted and thrown off the highway. Survivors told tales of horror. Then I come down the road and all those people that passed me, they're in the hospital now. They're hurt. One guy has no eyes. He tore his eyes right out from here right down to here. He's got no eyes. The other guy is in the field. His car's level. I don't know how he got out of it. There was people and, and bodies all over and people just looked and drove. You can't do that. That's not human. Throughout the day and night, more than 200 victims were rushed to three city hospitals by ground and by air. The mayor of Edmonton could not believe what he saw. Well, I've never seen uh, twisted uh, beams like I saw just now. I've never seen uh, washers and dryers and uh, completely mangled. There's three big piles of stuff, about four or five trailers that they're working on to see if there are any bodies underneath. In one of those piles, there's a dog barking. And I think that uh, the owner may be with the dog. It's terrible. There is disbelief that the tornado which destroyed so much, killed and injured so many, lasted just 35 minutes. James McCawa, NBC News, Edmonton, Canada. The tornado ripped through the middle of the Evergreen trailer court. On each side, there is little damage, but the rest is a pile of rubble and a storehouse of grief. Joanne Merriam lost her house. It is simply a jumble of personal belongings and twisted building materials. Her friends helped her find some small personal treasures. That's all this storm let her keep. <laughs> Cause of death, multiple blunt injuries. But the storm saved its worst blow for the trailer park. One twister hit, and when people thought it was over, a second hit. It has come in a never-ending stream since the tornadoes hit. Don't be afraid to load up on the clothes. Give her a lot. She just lost everything she's ever owned in her life. Clothes, blankets, shoes, and food. Tons of it. We've got about a ton and a half to two tons of meat. We could use more of that by the car load and by the truck load. We've got semi-trailers that we're just filling right up. Five it's trucks. just great. Five, five trailers. Five trailers. It's wonderful, yeah. It's great stuff. There are now literally mountains of relief supplies donated by people from all parts of Alberta. There is so much that the Edmonton Relief Center has lost track of what it has. The center's director finds it all very hard to describe. We're going to have to think up a new word for the dictionary because it has been absolutely awesome. Alberta Premier Don Getty also found that words were hard to come by as he toured the worst of the destruction. Nature uh, humbles you and leaves you so helpless. Uh, you. Uh, to prepare for this kind of a move by nature is almost impossible. But he pledged that money from the province to rebuild will not be a problem. Deputy Prime Minister Don Mazankowski and External Affairs Minister Joe Clark, both from Alberta, viewed the damage from the air. We're not used to this sort of thing here. Uh, we have become accustomed to living with hard nature, but uh, nature that has a, a different face than, uh, than this kind of uh, devastation. The federal government said that they will also chip in just over $2 million.
There is another dimension to this tragedy, one whose effects will last for months, perhaps even years. This is the Sherwood Industrial Park. It has been totally destroyed. And gone for the foreseeable future are hundreds and perhaps thousands of jobs. Today, some of those who used to work here came back. It was a big gust of wind blew me, and I wound up underneath one of the machines there, and I just braided my life. <laughs> what are your plans now? I don't know. Uh, get through this. Uh, I lost my, my vehicle and whatnot, so go look for another job, I guess. Some companies managed to salvage some of their vital documents. Others were not so lucky. Laid laws, invoices, and accounting was spread over a man's lawn up at Legal, 40 miles from here. That's gone. Jack Chesney fears that some of the companies that used to be here may not be able to survive. But it won't, he says, be for lack of spirit. It's the young entrepreneur, the guts, and the risk taker. And he's here. I can show you what's left of his places. But he'll come back. He'll come back, believe me. And we'll all help him come back. Tom Clark, CTV News, Edmonton. Yesterday's storm in Edmonton is one of the worst natural disasters to hit Canada this century. The worst occurred in 1954. It was Hurricane Hazel, which cut a swath around Toronto and left 81 people dead. Also among the worst storms, a series of tornadoes that ripped through southern Ontario in 1985. They cut a zigzag path through several communities, including Barrie, leaving 12 people dead and 500 homes damaged or destroyed. Several other tornadoes have caused severe damage in Canada, including one in 1979 that killed two people in Woodstock, Ontario, and injured more than 140. The Prime Minister received a warm and noisy welcome as he arrived in Les Escomins. But when the disaster in Edmonton was mentioned, the auditorium became quiet as the residents of the small Quebec town reflected on the tragedy. On behalf of the uh, people of Canada and the government of Canada, I had the occasion uh, last night to uh, call Premier Getty to uh, convey to him and to the people of Alberta uh, and to the families of those affected by the tragedy our sense of shock and sorrow. And the Prime Minister said the federal government will participate in the relief effort. I had a conversation with Premier Getty in which I offered the full support of the government of Canada and the people of Canada in terms of programs that we might have available or others that perhaps we ought to have available. The Prime Minister spent the rest of the day visiting three small communities near Quebec City. He then tried his hand at conducting a youth orchestra. He was that the residents of Les Escoumins felt moved to pay tribute to the victims. That's what Canada is all about, sharing. Sharing the good times and the bad. Mulroney will be in Edmonton on Tuesday to announce an economic aid package that may total as much as $1 billion. The money was intended to go towards diversifying the Western economy, but now some of it may be used to rebuild houses and businesses shattered by Friday's tornado. Mark Sixtrom, CTV News, near Bay St. Paul, Quebec. Thank you for joining us tonight. In the midst of all the destruction and suffering, it is a small consolation to know that at least no more people have died that we need not add to the list of 25 that we already have. The official death toll in the wake of yesterday's killer tornadoes remains at 25 tonight. 14 have been identified. The following five were all killed in the Evergreen Trailer Park. 15-year-old Sharon Andrichow, 50-year-old Merle Bain, Marie Barker, also 50, 55-year-old Lloyd Fankinel, and 73-year-old Etta Nolan, 59-year-old Mary Putnam. Now to the people who are unknown to have died in the city's southeast industrial area. They are 19-year-old George Dimitrios, 30-year-old Ajmer Dhaliwal, 29-year-old Richard Gillespie, 18-year-old Daniel Lewis, 40-year-old Edito Mendoza, 54-year-old Clement Nault, 43-year-old Graham Palmer, and 41-year-old Gregory Trebinic. The medical examiner's office are calling the official cause of death multiple blunt injuries. Well, the search for survivors or victims continued today through the rubble, just as it did all night. We have a number of reports for you, beginning with this one from Rick Castiglione. They searched through the night. Soldiers, firemen, volunteers looking for survivors. And more often, they found victims. For hours, they dug through this one pile of rubble, a home looking for an elderly woman. 
she had not found the safety of a nearby base. Members, the hardest part of all. It was the aftermath, the personal things, like pictures, uh, the albums, the uh, papers, the letters, the things that afterwards that you can't replace. You can replace lights, you can replace furniture, but it was the things that we couldn't replace. That there's a whole gap in your life missing. In the cold and in the rain, that is exactly what hundreds of people come back to look for. The things they can't replace. Kelly McLugan, CBC News, Edmonton. Both the provincial and federal governments have promised to help victims, although a dollar figure has not yet been put on the aid package. Premier Getty is promising to replace every destroyed home. The federal government will probably spend 50 cents for every dollar Alberta puts forward. This morning, the Premier and his wife toured the hardest hit areas. Kevin Tibbles reports. The evergreen trailer park northeast of the city. A graveyard of twisted metal and rubble. Fourteen people lost their lives here yesterday afternoon in the space of about ten minutes. Today, firefighters and volunteers looked for more. Missing, presumed dead. Today, the politicians came to look to try and console those who may have lost everything they had in the world. You will not be asked as individuals to take care of this. Uh, you couldn't ask individuals to protect themselves against this or to rebuild from it. The province and uh, all of the community pulling together are going to do it. We're going to rebuild for them. The Premier, along with several cabinet ministers, all said they couldn't believe their eyes. What's worse, there are no words that can describe the harm to the families, you know, the grief, because there's been injury and death and There's bits of people's trailers, their possessions, boats, cars, everything all piled on top of each other. And I think what it indicates is that how uh, the death toll was as, as high as it was. Uh, can you imagine being in the middle of this while it was happening? There's total disbelief. We've never seen anything like this. We're from southwestern Ontario, so we have seen tornadoes before, but we've never seen this sort of devastation. This pile of rubble, no doubt, yesterday was somebody's home. And by looking at the toys in the ground here, some of the children's books, it's obvious that there were kids living here. It's not known whether or not anyone got out of this trailer alive. But what is known is that the words being used to describe this disaster all mean the same thing. Horror. Sometimes that horror is written all over a person's face. You had some friends in there? Yeah. That's their car and everything right over there. Are they, have they died? We, we haven't found her body yet. The last report. Where were you? Where were you when this thing hit? I just came in. Two minutes after it happened. I live, I live right over here. What What did it look like two minutes after it happened? Right there now. The dust was just settling. Just like hell. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's their car. Her mother's car and his truck. No word? Just a few kilometers away in Clareview, most houses remained on the ground. But the roofs didn't remain on the houses. Today was an ironic time for homeowners, finding dishes untouched while the house is in ruins. But for Don Gardner, the storm was too much. He retired just three weeks ago. Now he is practically homeless. It's an awful sound. It's like a, a first a big whirring sound and then, a, then things banging and smashing together and, 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 and whacking and like a, a big piece hit the side of the wall there and then the fence started to fly. Traffic rule in the book, rushing a week old baby to hospital. The child was found in the wreckage of its home. I kept pulling the toes and uh, trying to get the fingers moving. It kept grabbing a little bit, and uh, every once in a while I would let out a whimper, and that's all I was concerned about was that it was still making noise. It seemed pretty content right there, uh, sitting on my lap in that blanket. It was warm.
the rest of the miracle when the rains could start again and uh, it's a fairly new home and fairly new appliances and we, th we thought if we could uh, store them in a safe place until he got back home uh, and then he could make a decision at that time in terms of uh, what he wants to do the men working on the roof are paid by the insurance company they're throwing up temporary shelter to protect what remains of the house In the kitchen, relatives are sorting through shelves, looking for what's left. Okay, we're coming to the steps. Okay, so uh, down what used to be the hallway, they're hauling out the fridge. They're planning to store it in somebody's garage. A few blocks away, Mike Bradley just had a chat with his insurance adjuster. Bradley's home is completely level and the insurance man says there's nothing much worth salvaging. The, the big thing is uh, to try to get as much protected as possible and, and again, you know, have people salvage as much of their property and protect their houses from any further damage. This one's an extreme case, the house is gone, but in a lot of cases you have houses where their roofs are partially missing and things like that and we have crews out covering up the roofs and uh, trying to protect the balance of the house from any additional damage. But Bradley's sifting through the ruins anyway and he's got some help today from Frank Rickman. Frank Rickman had never met Mike Bradley before today. So two or three neighbors here, then there's another two or two or three who just showed up. I, they showed up yesterday. There were strangers who volunteered and they're back here today. It's been great that they've been doing that. In total, about 400 families were left homeless by Friday's tornado. The insurance industry estimates the total damage will eventually exceed $100 million but no one knows for sure. While the job of estimating the damage to private homes is well underway, in the industrial area of Sherwood Park, the job has barely begun. This afternoon, crews were still working on a search and rescue operation. They're searching for bodies and checking to make sure there's no dangerous waste strewn by the tornado. People who work in the devastated industrial area won't be allowed in before Monday. That's how long the preliminary clear-up is going to take. This afternoon, the government announced that it will be opening a number of victims' assistance centers starting tomorrow. Strathcona waited until noon today to give permission to employers and their workers to come into the area. Well over a hundred people passed through the RCMP lines, salvaging what they could and shaking their heads with disbelief. This is going to be hard on us, especially us. We just finished moving and we got bills up the yin yang now. <laughs> it's going to take a lot more on behalf of our competitors than to send a tornado down us to, to stop us. We're ready to go. Tomorrow morning we've got work to do. My dad did work the next morning and, um, you know, we'll, we'll bounce back. It's going to take more than a tornado to stop us. This gentleman was at the lake when the twister struck. He rents this space and doesn't know if it's covered by insurance. We really don't know if we've got insurance, even contents in this place. Because we rented the building, we don't know until we see our adjuster. Fortunately, the employees who work at many of the businesses here were allowed to go home early Friday. Otherwise, the task of cleaning up the twisted metal and crushed concrete would be much more grim. Susan Amarongan, 23 TV Eyewitness News. Every half hour, a bus arrives in the Evergreen Mobile Home Park carrying victims of Friday's killer tornado. They deboard, register with the police, and are then escorted to what's left of their homes where they attempt to piece together their shattered lives. To go through this is, is this something I never want to go through again as long as I live and, and it's just, what, what, what can you say about something that's just ripped away from you? I mean, and, and it, you feel so helpless. Helpless that you, I wasn't there with my family. I was helpless, I feel helpless that there's nothing I could do with to, to restore any of this, to save any of this. There's no way you can combat nature like that. There's, there's no way you can be prepared. John Crimes was driving home when the tornado swept through the park and destroyed his house. His wife and children were inside. While his two daughters are with him today, his wife is in hospital with a severed spine, a fractured skull, and numerous broken bones and cuts. 
A sister-in-law and family friend have also joined crimes today for his first visit back home. I just couldn't face it. I tried to come out here a couple times and I just, I couldn't. And even now, I'm just, I, it's just all coming back. You know, you know I, I look at their, I look at their, mech, their, their wreck and the carnage and I just thank the God that my family came through it. I just can't. I just can't believe this. You know. I mean, you, you see it on television. You hear it in the news, and you you feel for the people. But you just. You know what I mean. You just. You just can't feel because you you don't. You haven't experienced it. But you see something like this, just total. Totally. I mean, like I was saying to my sister-in-law. You know, we've got. We've been married now for 13 years, and we've got a few pictures. We did not know what was happening or going on, and the worst part was if my sister and my mom were alive or not. Sifting through the rubble, Crimes counts his blessings. His family survived. Fifteen other people in the park didn't. And while he feels for the less fortunate, he still finds it hard to accept the fact that he's lost some treasured possessions forever. It's just, it's just, uh, uh, just like a, a whole part of my life's been ripped away. Just, there's nothing. I mean, I mean, I got my family, praise the Lord for that, but everything else is, is gone. I mean, it's not just a simple matter of replacing a home, but it's everything that was within it. You know, the memories, the... We've had uh, some deaths in our family, and their, their things were passed on to us. I mean, how do you replace it? After less than an hour, crimes leaves, probably never to come back. He says there's just too many memories here, representing too much loss for him, his children, and especially his wife. I mean, you can heal her, and you can, you can fix up her body, but you're not going to take those memories away, and those, those fears and those anxieties. To have, you know, to close your eyes and to, to see it every time you close your eyes, you almost don't want to sleep anymore. We're all facing it right now. Steve Hogel, 2-3 TV, Eyewitness News. ...app continues today as the Prime Minister tours the disaster site, while the relief effort continues to help people rebuild their lives and the memorial service provides some comfort. In sports today, the Expos are up, then they're down. Good evening. It's been more than three days since it happened, but everybody's still getting phone calls from friends and relatives from all over. Is everyone all right, they want to know. And for most Edmontonians, the answer to that question is yes. But for many more, it is not. Twenty-six people died. Scores were injured. Hundreds of homes were destroyed. Hundreds more were damaged. Dozens of businesses were wiped out in Friday's tornado, and hundreds of jobs went with those businesses. But Edmonton continues to respond with unprecedented generosity. Relief centers are bulging with donations. And tonight, Prime Minister Brian Mulroney toured the Evergreen Trailer Court site. He was accompanied by Don Mazankowski, the Deputy Prime Minister. The PM spoke with a number of residents who had lost all their belongings in the tornado. He said he found the site of devastation hard to fathom, hard to believe. The PM also said that federal and provincial help was on its way. Oh, no, we've been... Uh working in very close cooperation to deal with uh, all aspects of the problem and I think uh, be quite successful. So I, I think I, I'm encouraged by what I hear and see. Moreover, the, uh, the uh, programs are functioning smoothly and quickly. People are not uh, having to wait uh, undue periods of time, so that's encouraging. Everything's functioning well. So we've got a great degree of cooperation going on with the feds and uh, the province and the city, which is exactly the way it should be pain on their faces and the tear-filled eyes tell the story. My heart just goes out to people who lost family. People like Sandy Newell return to the Evergreen Mobile Home Park today to sift through the rubble that once was their homes. They painstakingly searched through the wreckage for personal mementos and whatever else they could salvage. There wasn't much. Residents are still in shock and many don't know what the future holds. I'm just living one minute at a time and letting him Letting him guide me. I don't know what to do next. It's just whatever happens next. Does the reality of what happened really set in yet? I haven't had time. I've been out here every day, or we've been waiting down at the checkpoint to get in. Wait for six, seven hours to get in, spend an hour and a half, and then get back out because, well, other people want in. They're, other people's wait isn't waited as long as we have. They deserve a right to pick through it. But we want to stay. <laughs> What's left of your place? A mess. 
you know, some things might be okay, but when you look at it with mud and everything all over, what do you, you don't want that. From here, where do you go? Oh, thank, thank you very much. Meantime, businesses in the Southeast Industrial Park took on the task of starting anew. The destruction caused by Friday's tornado could top the $150 million mark. Fires Transport was one of the many buildings which felt the wrath of the tornado. As a new work week begins, so does a sign of hope. Employees came to work today to see their job site gone, ravaged by Mother Nature. But life goes on, and plans are already underway to rebuild. They're salvaging uh, as much as the structural as they can. Uh, we've got some people in town right now working on <coughs> repairing that if possible and, and fabricating some new stuff. And uh, we hope to be building as soon as possible here and, uh, and back on site. When I came here originally Saturday morning, I just couldn't believe what I seen, eh? But uh, I think what happened was, it's what, what did happen, it's brought everybody closer together and we're all, you know, in there helping and we want to get it cleaned up and get back to business, eh? While staff at Byers salvage what they can and do their best to carry on business as usual, the future looks bleak at the Stelco plant just blocks away. Hundreds of jobs may be in jeopardy as the company struggles to recover from massive damages. 600 people are employed at the plant, but as many as 400 may be out of work. At this point, we are telling the production people, the operators and so on, that uh, they should consider themselves uh, laid off, and that is so that they can, as soon as possible, apply for unemployment insurance benefits. Stelco officials are doing their utmost to notify employees and keep them abreast of their job situations, but the forecast looks grim. The plant may be shut down for nine months before they fully recover from Friday's tragedy. Chris Durham, ITV News. This is Franca Catoni. Henry and Sherry Marks have lost everything. Their Clairview area home was demolished in Friday's tornado. Now they are trying to get their lives back together. Okay. Just hold those numbers and then we can get you in touch with somebody. Yeah. They have come to Emmy Lazard Composite High School. Here, the three levels of government have set up a victim's assistance center. The homeless will be provided with one month of rent-free housing, in addition to food, clothing, furniture, money and counselling. There are many questions to be answered and many forms to be filled out. As the Marks is anxiously await to find out where their new home will be, they bump into a neighbour. All are thankful their families escaped without injury. She stopped to order Aaron's birthday cake. And if she hadn't stopped to order the cake, she would have been home. Or if this had happened two hours two later, hours everybody later. would have been home from work. Most of the people in our area were fortunate because they were either on holidays or at work. They hadn't gotten home from work yet. After an hour and a half, Henry, Sherry, and their 11-month-old son, James, are given the good news. A home has been found for them. They've got us a place to live, food, pretty well taking care of everything we need. At least we've got a roof over our head and stuff. Now we can start looking at starting to get our lives back together and getting our house started building and getting things going again. By the end of the day, 70 families have their own place to go to. It's a beginning for these victims who have been forced to start from square one all over again. People like Lionel Wilson, whose home used to be in the Evergreen Trailer Park. We just moved it down in July and it was comfortable. We were just set up and just nicely moving in and everything was comfortable. We just went away from all the but uh, I wouldn't mind it, but I know right now my wife will never have a mobile trailer. But then there are those victims like Murray Crisp. His only concern is his wife and two-month-old son. Both were seriously injured in Friday's disaster. Well, you could be doing better, I think. What do they have? What kind of injuries? Oh, she's got a broken leg. Ruptured lung and ribs and broken back bones. My son's got a fractured skull and stuff. Throughout this entire ordeal, Edmontonians have opened up their hearts. Donations of food, clothing and furniture have packed two huge warehouses and people are still lining up to give even more. We're moving everything as quick as we can, but if you want to hold off, we'll get somebody to help you. Do you want me to park somewhere? No, you can just wait right in line. Okay, thanks for coming. You bet. Thousands of others are volunteering their time. They are sorting, boxing and delivering anything and everything. As more volunteers come through the doors, they are given quick instructions and immediately put to work. And some into transporting from what you're sorting 
over to this section. Edmontonians are the most beautiful people, not just Edmontonians, all of Alberta. Donations can be dropped off at 11410 Kingsway Avenue, or you can call 452-1854. Emergency relief services still needs baby furniture, kitchen utensils, small kitchen appliances, and living room and bedroom furniture. However, all other donations are welcome. Franca Catoni, ITV News. There was a memorial service for the victims today, for the families and friends of the 26 people killed. For many of the 250 people who came out for the service, the full impact of the disaster is just beginning to set in. Susan Smitten reports. Connie Galling lost her son at the Evergreen Trailer Park. Mildred Murray lost four close friends when the Reimer family's mobile home was destroyed by the storm. We are faced with the reality of our own vulnerability, frailty, our own mortality. So in faith we come to the Lord, ask for his, for his protection, for his love, for his compassion. Many of these people came to this service looking for emotional or spiritual support. For the majority, the impact of the disaster is only just beginning to sink in. Shock has numbed most of the families and friends of the 26 people killed by Friday's tornado. All kinds of reasons for coming here this morning. I want to come to give thanks. I'm alive. Some of my friends have gone to God. I want to wonder why them and not me. There's been a strong sense of community loss since the storm. Edmonton's support for the victims has been overwhelming. Food and clothing have poured in. People have opened their hearts to the survivors. And in particular, we pray for all who have died so tragically during the tornado. Particularly, Sharon Andrichow, Myrtle Bain, However, many here could not understand why so many innocent lives were taken. They found solace in today's service, but few answers. May his perfect sacrifice free them from the power of death and give them everlasting life. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. For Connie Galling, this service provided some comfort, although its effects will be spread thin over the next few weeks as she works to rebuild her life. Susan Smitten, ITV News. While people try to clean out their homes and get their lives back together, they are having to deal with a constant parade of sightseers. The Clareview area has become Edmonton's number one attraction. Brent Gilbert has that story. They've come to view the disaster with their own eyes. Hundreds of the curious have lined the streets of suburbs throughout Clareview. As residents sift through the wreckage of their homes, local bystanders take pictures and walk through the ruins. Uh, they don't want anybody down here unless they're living right on the block here. They're kicking everybody out. Oh, we just came around the back? Yeah, no, but the police are down there now. They're kicking everybody out there. Disaster personnel and police have tried to keep the tourists away but many still manage to squeeze through. Homeowners are telling the public they're just plain fed up. I wish they'd stay away. We have lots of help, friends, family that have come, and we don't need sightseers. It's an old letter opener. Along with my dad. Shirley's husband, Ken, retrieves a few precious items from the rubble. Their $90,000 home was ripped apart in the storm. Heavy traffic in the streets has made the recovery job even tougher. The morbidly curious who come by, stop and gawk, come pushing past you to take pictures, uh, have no respect for your privacy, for your emotions, or for your property. Mike Bradley's home next door was opened up like a tin can when the tornado hit. Now the tourists simply walk through it. I asked a, a, a group of, of four to leave. They were just going through and, and looking while we were trying to, to pick up our things. 
While many of these homes have been literally ripped from their foundations, some residents have managed to retain their sense of humor. This sign reads, lost one garage. If found, please return. Residents in Clareview would like to send a simple message to would-be tornado sightseers. Please stay home and watch the pictures on TV. Brent Gilbert, ITV News. A couple of other notes about the disaster. Police have arrested another looter. A 28-year-old Edmonton man has been charged with theft of about $2,000 worth of machine tools from one of the blown-out buildings in the southeast industrial area. Sightseeing is a problem along the Sherwood Park Freeway as well, causing all kinds of difficulties for regular traffic into and out of Sherwood Park. Police ask you to keep moving. Well, coming up on ITV News, news from the Persian Gulf, from Washington, D.C., and from Cape Canaveral. The shock of the Edmonton tornado was that it was so completely unexpected. Twisters are quite common in the so-called Tornado Alley in the Midwestern United States, but no one expected one as far north as Edmonton. Friday's disaster revealed how little is known about these freak storms. A tornado can start wherever warm, moist air collides with cold air. The collision triggers a violent thunderstorm. It could stop there, but sometimes winds begin to spin. As the warm air is forced up by the heavier, colder air, a funnel forms. The winds swirl counterclockwise at hundreds of kilometers an hour, and a low-pressure system builds up at the tip of the funnel. The end product is like a vacuum cleaner strong enough to rip homes off their foundations. Tornadoes usually strike in late afternoon. But other than that, scientists can't say much about when or where tornadoes will form. They're working on developing new techniques to track tornadoes, but even these fail to give the residents of Edmonton more than a few minutes' warning of the ominous cloud looming on the horizon. Joining us from Halifax, science commentator Bob Fournier. Bob, why can't we predict when and where tornadoes will strike? Well, in part, we can't predict them because we don't exactly know what drives them. And uh, I suppose that's because they're so ephemeral. They're here and there. The average lifetime of a tornado is uh, anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes, although there are some longer, of course. But because of that, you don't know where to go and observe them. And so if you can't do that, you can't necessarily identify the features which drive them. Even now, the best people um, in the business can only give you a very crude estimate a as to why these things do what they do and effectively, effectively they go out and they look at the environment and they try and correlate things. But I think there's a lot of um, ambiguity associated with what scientists believe and the actual um, situation itself. People in Edmonton on Friday got almost no warning. I think more of them may have just simply looked up and seen the funnel than got a warning from their radio or television sets. I think, th I think at the present state of our knowledge, that's the best that you can hope for. Uh, you can hope to be told that a situation exists that can lead to a tornado, but I don't think it's possible uh, it, with a present state of knowledge to say a tornado is coming, because even if, even if they could tell, you'd only get about 10 or 12 minutes worth of warning. Do you know what actually makes up a tornado, what its components are? Well, tornadoes are formed, as you're probably well aware, by the mixing of warm air and cold air, and the warm air moves up from below, and move, as it moves up into the upper atmosphere, it seems to be struck by high winds in the jet stream, which cause it to rotate. Now, does that give you a simple sort of a, a rotating hose, or is there more to this storm than that? Well, the most interesting observation that I have ever read was from a farmer about 60 years ago in Kansas who, just before a tornado struck, he was standing in, a cyclone, in the doorway to a cyclone cellar. He looked up, and when he did, he looked right up the center of a tornado because it was above the ground, and it was not a threat to him. When he looked inside, one of the most interesting things he reported was that not only was this a tube extending up into the sky, but inside on the inner ring were lots of little tornadoes which were moving around. And scientists have since discovered that those little inner tornadoes are moving even faster than a large one and are responsible for some of the preciseness which we see in tornadoes, where they strike something and 50 feet away they don't, they don't harm it at all. So if I see a funnel cloud on the horizon coming generally in my direction, what do you do? Well, I think what you, d you do what the people who are in the uh, tornado capital of the world, which is are in the area of Kansas or Texas, where they get about a thousand of them a year, what they have done is to build cyclone cellars. They effectively have a cellar with a quick access door which they go down and hide in. And uh, as the storm passes over, I think they survive it that way. But remember that this, this funnel has a, a low pressure area in it as well. It can suck things out. 
Um, I remember one case that I read about where blankets were actually torn off a bed and drawn up a chimney right into, into the spout, or they, they plucked the feathers right off a chicken. So I don't think even a, a cyclone cellar is necessarily as safe as we would like it to be. Now, Edmonton is not cyclone country, but Kansas is. Obviously, you can have cyclones in Edmonton, but you have more of them in Kansas. Why? Well, it has to do, again, with the converging air masses. And the capital of the world, as I said, is in Kansas, but warm air moves up from the Gulf of Mexico. Cold air comes down from the central part of, the, uh, of North America, and the two converge, and they give you lots of thunderstorms and lots of tornadoes. As you move away from that to the north, up to about 50 degrees north, seems to be the upper limit, although Edmonton is about 53 degrees. Uh, the, 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 the necessary combination of warm, moist air and cold, dry air it doesn't work anymore. And so it's only on those odd situations that you get it happening. For example, tornadoes generally happen in late afternoons. And the reason that they do is because in late afternoon you've got the heat of the day building up and then that warm, moist air begins to rise. That produces a thunderstorm. Sometimes that thunderstorm gets exaggerated out into a tornado and turns into this violent spiral effect. Bob Fournier, thanks very much. Thank you. The Journal returns after this. The CTV National News, substituting for Lloyd Robertson, Sandy Ronaldo. Good evening. There was more help today for people whose lives were devastated by last Friday's tornadoes in Edmonton. There was new housing, new clothing, and other help for those affected. It is part of a unique aid program that's been set up aimed at cutting through miles of red tape, as well as leaving hundreds homeless. The tornadoes also left 26 people dead and scores of others injured. Henry Kowalski has more. Well, where, where were you living? Evergreen. Albert and Sherry came to the help center to get a new house. I mean, no charge for the first month. In the morning, they signed for it. A few hours later, they were in it, keys in hand, families. Daily, the survivors make their pilgrimage to their ruined houses and come away with another small bag of personal belongings. They get the rest from the center. If they're not insured, they get money, help to clean up, unemployment benefits, workman's compensation, and there is on-the-spot counseling. They'll walk out, hopefully, with all their immediate needs looked after. The victims need only make one other stop at the relief center. Frances Thompson chooses what she needs from the tons of clothes and food that have been donated. Said the further to discussions with Premier Getty and to Mr. Mazagosti, we'll do whatever is necessary to be helpful. I never put a dollar figure on it. Sean Larratt, CBC News, Edmonton. In Sherwood Park's industrial area, business people were getting their first glimpse of the devastation today. And in Edmonton, the first 29 people were given housing from a victim assistance center. Paul Adams reports. It's 9.30 at the Emmy Lizert School. Whether they're going to fix my trailer, actually, I don't know whether it's worth fixing. About 500 families lost their homes last Friday. The government's providing a month's free accommodation for those dislodged. But the government won't guess how many hundreds of jobs have been lost in the battered Sherwood Park industrial area. Some operations, like trucking companies, may be able to lease vehicles and be back in business quickly. But the Labour Minister says some manufacturers may not be back in full operation for six to nine months. Three days after the tornado struck, the industrial area still looks like a bomb site. Three days ago, this was a parking lot. Now it looks like a wrecker's yard. The RCMP finished their search and rescue here this morning, and by noon they were packing up their gear. Minutes later, business owners and employees were lining up for permission to enter the area for the first time since Friday. Each of them got a warning like this, saying you enter a disaster area at your own risk. This structural engineer is here to advise people entering the area. Most of the buildings are quite dangerous. Uh, we had the opportunity to walk through, and uh, some of the buildings that we walked through, we quickly found out that we shouldn't have been there either. But despite the warnings, people were scrambling through buildings this afternoon, salvaging what they could. Graham Heath has just returned to his business with insurance adjusters. 
An early estimate puts total damage at fifty to a hundred thousand dollars. This expensive piece of equipment, now just a piece of junk, will cost over twenty thousand dollars to replace. But Heath figures he's one of the lucky ones. Uh, native uh, Edmontonian and uh, tornadoes I thought were things that other people have, not us. So it's, uh, it's quite a really surprise. It's very hard to take it all in, really, the extent of the damage and all the landmarks are, are missing and uh, it's really uh, strange, very, very strange feeling. And we feel very, very lucky. We feel almost uh, it's nothing more than a minor irritation than what we've suffered compared to the devastation that's all around us here. A few hundred meters away, Versatile Cold Storage is already back in operation. But Versatile is an exception amidst the wreckage of Friday's storm. It took only minutes for this to happen. It will take months, perhaps years, to repair. Paul Adams, CBC News, Edmonton. One of the companies hard hit by the tornado will be back in business tomorrow. The staff of Buyers Transport have been working through the weekend and they'll be in new facilities tomorrow morning. The company has gathered equipment from other branches and found a warehouse on 76th Avenue. Meanwhile, police have laid another charge of looting in connection with Friday's tornado. A man was found taking $2,000 worth of machinist tools from Lee Mason Tools on 27th Street. 28-year-old Timothy Doan appears in court tomorrow. This is the third person to be charged in relation to looting after the tornado. Police, of course, are trying to cut back those losses, and they're doing that by checking all vehicles that are leaving the industrial area. The city of Edmonton is going to hold a memorial service for the victims of the tornado Thursday night. That will be at 7 o'clock at the convention center. Today, about 200 people attended a service at St. John Bosco Church in Clareview. It was held for the families of those killed in the tornado and those who survived it. Survivors like Connie and Joe Golan. Right around my, my residence here, so I thought that something must be happening, and uh, I went downstairs and... Um, Went over to the phone and uh, looked out on the uh, or the patio windows and up into the air and the cloud was now right over the the house and I could see small wisps of uh, cloud uh, circling and milling around. So at that point I phoned the weather office and uh, the gentleman that answered the phone. Uh, I said I'm out at the international airport here. What's happening to the weather? And, uh, he replied to me, Well, it's uh, kind of hectic out there, isn't it? And I said, Well is there a tornado in the area? And uh, his immediate response was, uh, have you seen a funnel? He says, yeah. I said, I saw one touch the ground. And he said, just hang on, just a minute. And I could hear him holler to somebody in the background, and he came back on the phone, and he said, I'm going to put you on hold. I don't want you to hang up. Uh, I want you to talk to somebody else. And almost immediately uh, after he put me on hold, uh, somebody picked up the phone and said, I'm with the Severe Weather Department. Tell us what you've seen. So then I described this uh, thin 10-second uh, funnel that I had seen and uh, how the debris was coming up and the fact that uh, it was quite calm in the yard where uh, the house was situated. And he said, uh, we've got some trouble. I'm going to um, get uh, things uh, on the move. And uh, he took my name and my phone number and, uh, you know, thanked me for calling in. And uh, I was, must say, I was very impressed with how quickly uh, the mood uh, had changed with the uh, weather department. Uh, they were in this, at the time right now was, uh, you know, one minute to three. And uh, they, <laughs> they were moving. Let me ask you this, Mr. Taylor, one final question before we, we let you go tonight. Uh, when you saw this funnel, and when you saw it go past your house on its way towards the Edmonton area, did you have any idea the kind of destruction it might have been causing in the next hour or so? Not at this point, but uh, when I looked out from the loft window at approximately uh, three minutes uh, past three and uh, noticed this cloud on its uh, uh, northeast uh, travels and watched the actual funnel descend again, uh, which consequently stayed on the ground until approximately 3.15, 10 times the uh, magnitude of the one I'd seen to the southwest. Uh, believe me, <laughs> it was scary, because mm -hmm. I suddenly uh, an innocent cloud-like mm -hmm. cloud had turned into uh, uh, a very vicious, uh, very vicious thing. 
Mr. Taylor, I'd like to thank you very much for calling Nightline tonight. My pleasure, Neil. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night. And joining me now on the program, Dr. Bruce Monkhouse, an Edmonton area psychologist. Uh, we've all had heard stories, Dr. Monkhouse, of people who've been involved in the tornado who had seen the tornado. The last few days, you've been dealing directly with victims. Mm -hmm. and, and your specialty, in fact, is post trauma stress syndrome. It's one of the in I'm interested in the area of stress, that's true, yes. What kind of stress are these victims going through? What exactly are they experiencing here four days after the tornado? Well, I think there's a couple of things that have to be considered here. One is the, the actual immediate, fr this, this weekend, the people getting through just trying to, you know, put their lives back, to, back together in an immediate sense, trying to find a place to live. You know, some of these people have lost everything, you know, f including family and friends. So in an immediate sense, they're trying to just provide basic safety needs, as I say, food and shelter. That's one kind of need that, that is being met, and you've got to give the city of Edmonton a lot of credit. I mean, the uh, volunteer services, uh, the emergency relief teams have done a remarkably, you know, wonderful job of, of, of meeting those kinds of needs. Now, from a psychological point of view, a lot of these people are in, are in a very uh, severe, I mean, the most severe stress that a lot of these people are ever going to experience in their life has gone on this weekend. So in that kind of a sense, what they're trying to deal with now is, is in a sense, shock. And that's what we're looking at right away, right now. Now what I'm and my colleagues who are interested in this area are, are concerned about is what has been identified as post-traumatic stress disorder. What is that? Well, what happened six months down the road? Right. Or longer, for that matter. What we've been able to identify is that with severe disasters, floods, tornadoes, earthquakes, etc., there is some recognizable kinds of symptoms that seem to be common for a lot of these kind of people who've had this kind of common experience. And some of these symptoms are very severe from a psychological point of view. Um, nightmares, reliving the exper experience in a real vivid kind of a sense, almost a flashback, mm -hmm. not uncommon at all. Uh, depression, high levels of anxiety, um, inability to concentrate, inability to focus to, 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 to keep with the job situation, for example. Any number of those kinds of things uh, have been identified in, in with victims of, of severe disasters. How have you and, and your colleagues been trying to help these people in these last few days? You just talking to them? Yeah. To help? At this point, the simplest solutions are probably the most effective. Getting these people to verbalize some of this stuff. Get them, get them to talk about it with their friends, not just with psychologists or whoever's on site, but whoever is available, relatives, friends, uh, spouses, etc. Just getting them to open up and, and feel okay with the fact that they should be talking about this. They should be, able, they should be if they can, um, going on about what happened in, in as much detail as they feel comfortable. At, at this point, I think that's as effective as anything that can be done for them. People are going to need some space just to, to recollect their thoughts. Murray leaves with some of his belongings. Oh, he says after today, he's not coming back and he's not going to live in a trailer ever again. A couple of blocks away, Adrian Fowler and his friends search near what used to be his home. Adrian wasn't here when the tornado hit. His family wasn't either. They decided to stay put when the storm started getting ugly. But now it's hard to tell the children why they can't come home. They can't, they just can't understand it. You know, they, they, they want to come out, they want to know where we're going to live. What school are they going to go to? Like, Horse Hill School is just back over there. They want to know if the school was good. They're asking about friends. Most of them we found. Some we still don't know. So Adrian keeps looking to find things for his children, his wife, and for him. Are these yours? Yep, they're mine. Out, out, of the <laughs> out of the closet. Get some of the frustrations out. I, times I see how far I can throw something, just so I can throw it. wake up in the morning and you're sore but you're still going back at it because there is something left a little bit somewhere if we can find it then it makes it a part of our lives a little bit more better adrian has trouble concentrating he's emotional he's hurt and dr manko says that's what's expected people can become can dramatically uh, black moods anxiety looking up at the sky and wondering if it's going to happen again uh, can become quite withdrawn from their friends and, and family and, and work, lose their concentration, 
They can't seem to focus on anything. A whole, any combination of those things is possible for some of these people. And again, the, the difficulty is, is there's no set timeline. It could be a week, it could be months down the road. Adrian says his family will rebuild here. They're not moving away. They're just moving on. We learned that we've got each other. And uh, the material things, they count. But they aren't, they aren't the final end. The family is. And we'll just keep going. Sean O'Larrett, CBC News, Edmonton. The Alberta Public Safety Office has registered 90 families for loss or damage claims, while other agencies are providing things like transportation, food, and other needed assistance. Counselors as well are on hand to work with families trying to cope with the disaster. A support group, for example, will be meeting tomorrow night at 7 o'clock at the M.E. Lazert School. Anyone that still needs help has been asked to please contact the Assistance Center at M.E. Lazert School. It will be open tomorrow from 10 in the morning until 9 in the evening, and if you need a drive, call 476-8611. The number again if you need a drive is 476-8611. Volunteers have been going straight out ever since Friday night helping the tornado victims, but the needs of those people has been changing daily. Here's Christine Ritchie to update the relief effort. Another day at the emergency relief center, and donations keep pouring in. Doctor, if I could, mm -hmm. what would be the psychical, psychological after effect of people feeling mentally insulted because they weren't forewarned? by radio and TV that there was a tornado properly well I think there's a, a almost a natural reaction to be angry I think there's a lot of people who are experiencing anger right now because um, you know if they if I had been given more notice or if I had been able to get to the basement maybe I would have been able to save a friend or, or save uh, you know some kind of possessions so I think one immediate reaction is probably anger Absolutely. 